All right, so um, normally, as he mentioned, Gleb does this. Uh, you guys may have seen him over the years. Uh, his wife took him to Spain. Uh, so I get the opportunity to stand in front of you. We're actually making him work, by the way, while he's over there. We're sending him over to a conference in the Netherlands uh, to do a little presentation uh, next week. Um, so uh, no vacation for him. Yeah. Um, Today he's in Madrid, by the way. Um, so he let me uh, come up and do this one. I'm actually uh, the one who does the drive stats. So if you guys are familiar with those, um, I am the one who writes the, the blog posts and makes up all of the stories um, from the data that we have. Uh, and I'm gonna walk you through how we get there um, a little bit uh, about the drive stats that we produce. Love them or hate them, uh, we do them each quarter. And, uh, and I wanted to kind of give you a little bit of, of how we got there and, and like I said, what we do. Uh, we'll talk about the dry stats, the current ones, uh, how we produce them, um, and what they kind of mean and what we think they mean. Um, so we're all on the same page. And then there's a little bit at the end and we'll see how much time we have um, with regards to smart stats because we get all of that data too. Um, so you can, you, you'll be able to have some fun with that. Um, I make no claims to uh, whether or not you'll like this or not. Um, <laughs> some people uh, can't stand our numbers. Other people love them. Um, but we, we tell the story. And we tell you what we have and what's going on. So um, a little bit about how we got there. So Backblaze as a company has been around 10 years. Um, the state of Delaware thought it would be funny to incorporate us on 420. Um, and if you don't know what that means, ask the guy next to you. Um, so we just celebrated 10 years. We did um, a, a launch uh, of the original product a long time ago, back in 2008. But we really um, started to get people to pay attention when we did our first storage pod. The storage pods were those big red boxes that we store everything on, right? Um, and we not only published it, and he's told the world about it, but we published the specs and said, hey, go build your own. Um, as a matter of fact, I was talking to the folks over at Shutterfly just a little bit earlier, and they kind of embraced that. Um, and they took off with that design and I'm sure made lots of improvements, and we've done that over the years as well. Uh, we've grown a little bit from 10 petabytes back in 2010. We've crossed over 300. Uh, so that's what we have in management. I think we're over 350 although you didn't hear that from me yet. Um, we like to publicize stuff, right? Um, we did our first drive stats post back about in 2013, and that was done by Brian Beach, who some of you may know, um, uh, and he published a lot of fun stuff. And being um, a marketing company a little bit, we went out and went, oh, this is the greatest thing ever. Look at this, drive reliability stats. Which drive do you think is the best one? And people just tore us up. Um, <laughs> your environment's not the same as mine. Oh, yeah, okay. So I wanted to make sure uh, I, I'll couch that, okay? This is our environment. Um, by the way, that's, um, that's the very first storage pod, and yes, that is built out of plywood. All right, we prototyped these things a long time ago. Uh, for those of you who are uh, student, students of storage pods, that's actually 15 drives across, and you can see there'd be three rows. It's all 45, right? We literally built, prototyped the first one in plywood, which, by the way, if you don't know how to weld, is a really good way to build a storage pod. Um, we eventually moved to metal, by the way, um, before we started putting customer data on there. Um, Anyway, the, the hard drive data, okay, that we publish, um, we just did one uh, last week. Uh, we do them each quarter, like I said. We look for different insights and things of that nature that we have. Um, along the way, we've had lots of fun things that have given us data. Um, we went through the, uh, oh, it's a little fuzzy, huh? Uh, the, the Thailand drive crisis back in 2011, 2012. Right, and we talked about that a lot. If anybody wants to have a really good read, um, on the, on a, go to our blog and look up dry, uh, drive farming, uh, because that's actually what we did. If you, when we talk about now having 300 petabytes of drives and having uh, nearly 100,000 drives, excuse me, out there, 
um, we were sitting there going around to Costco's and buying drives two at a time um, in, order to be, in order to get around this. Um, and later on, we started doing things like building into vaults and all kinds of stuff like that. I won't go into what a backblaze vault is other than to say it's the way we store data these days. It's spread across 20 different devices and all of that, right? The end of it is, is like I said, we have about 300 petabytes of data, about 82,000 drives that are going to talk about today. Over the lifetime, we've had 95,000 or so drives. Uh, that have come through our system in various ways. Um, some of the lower density ones, the one, one and a half, two terabyte ones are now long gone uh, from our system. Um, but this is what we currently have as of the 31st of March of this year. In there, mostly four terabytes, most of them Seagates. Uh, you'll see that in a few minutes. Um, uh, a fair number of uh, HGST ones as well, by the way. Um, or Hitachi, depending on your point of view. Um, and then more recently, obviously, started adding sixes and eights. Okay, so we have a good smattering in there. Um, sad day when we retired some of the two terabyte ones because they were just killers. Um, they, they, were, they had numbers of sub 1% failure rates in our environment, which is you just, you just cry when you have to take them out um, because they just go. You put them in there, you close the lid, push it in the rack, turn on the power, and walk away. Um, and so, but you need the density, so you trade twos for eights. Um, and uh, it's been okay so far, and we'll see that in just a second. So hard drive failure rates, right? The basics. Um, how do we do what we do? We use this magic tool called Smart Mon Tools, right? Everybody uses that. It, there's nothing magical about it, right? We used to collect the data, we collect it once a day, okay, from every single drive in our data centers, right? And we used to store it for about 30 days um, so we could get an idea of what was going on in the system, look for problems, all of the things you would typically do with these kinds of tools, that kind of tool, information. Back in April of 2013, we started to keep it. So that's when our data set begins, okay? And, um, and I'll give you the URL in a little bit. If you would like the data from all of our drives, we will give it to you. Just download it from our site, and I'll give you the URL in a minute, right? We don't, uh, we don't hold it to ourselves. But it's, every, it's mostly um, all of our drives uh, every single day. There are a couple of holes in there where something went long, wrong with the system. Um, uh, you'll, you'll see them when you get there, particularly in 2013. It's all of the drives in our data centers. Uh, every drive that we have, including boot drives and management drives and all of those kinds of things. And so, but when we report the stats, we pull out everything except customer data drives that are in use. Just so you know, you'll see, I'll talk about a number that's 82,000. We have roughly 85 or 86,000 drives that we kind of monitor. So um, we try to keep the set all the same, right? So, but if you're really interested, the data's in there. If you're curious about how our boot drives work, okay, um, um, and what's going on. So what we get is, and if you've never seen this before, but that's just the output that you get. Every record is like that, right? It's going to be the date, serial number, so on and so forth. And then going to the, you're looking at it, right. Um, will be all of the different attributes, and we record them that way. We record the normalized and raw for all of the different attributes that can get reported. As you all know, or should probably know, smart stats vary, drive model, manufacturer, and so on. Um, HGST reports uh, smart stat 22 for the helium, amount of helium that's in a drive, um, and so on and so forth. All kinds of different things. Um, they're different. They're supposed to be consistent within model. They're generally, sometimes they are, most times they're not, okay? <laughs> um, so it makes for really interesting analysis sometimes. And then it goes down and obviously there's just more records. And any given day, you'll get 82, 85,000 of the records in there for a given day. So if you wanted to start thinking about doing some analysis, that's the kind of challenge you have. The one thing that we add to all of this is that little failure column that currently has all zeros in it, right? 
If there's a one in that column, that means the drive failed. In other words, we removed it from our, our environment. All right, and that's the designation that says, hey, that thing will no longer be seen. And it actually disappears from the next day. So if there's a one on that very first one, the next day that record is not there anymore. That's how you look at it. We count, and I'll go into this in a minute, um, about something called drive days, and you'll see what that means. But that's the indication. How many days does that drive exist? All right. Again, the period is from April to the end of March. Uh, there's actually 95,000 different drives in there over that four plus year period or nearly four year period, right? Some of them have migrated away. Some of them have failed. We've had 5,674 failures, right? Um, over that time period. Um, drive days, the number of days a drive existed, it was operational. Right? So if a drive is put into play um, on the 1st of January and, goes in, and then comes out at the end of January, that's 31 drive days. That's the way we count, and it's the way we do all of our math. All right? We don't look at the number of hours or anything like that from that smart stats reports, and I'll get to that in a minute. Um, but you can kind of see uh, the different numbers that we have. So 62 million drive days we're doing analysis on. If you wanted to just do what a lot of folks like to do when they look at our math and say, hey, if I take the number of drives and divide it by the number of failures, or vice versa, excuse me, I get a failure rate of 5.97%. That's the failure rate. And we go, no, no, that's not the way we calculate it. We calculate something called an annualized failure rate. And the reason we do it that way is, is because sometimes the failure rate needs to be calculated over a three-month period or a six-month period or whatever, or a four-year period. And so that's the little formula, okay? Just drive failures basically divided by drive days, right? Drive days are the number of drives that system, we had that number of days that drive was in our system. That's the math we use. If you wanted to go look at smart stats and pull off the number of drive hours and then do some math and calculate drive days, you could do that. The one downside to that is if you end up using reconditioned drives at all, sometimes the smart stats don't get wiped out. And you put a drive in play that already has hours on it. And sometimes, the drive number of hours, especially when a drive goes to fail, sometimes that number is really goofy. Like, I existed for the last 22 years. So we use the drive, the number of the smart stats to kind of sanity check us sometimes, but this is the best way to do it. Just count it if it's there and it's working. Um, and that's the way you'll see it in our data. So if you want to do analysis, that's the way we did it. So what do we get when we start to do this kind of analysis? This is the one, uh, the report, this is the quarterly report. So for the period of Q1 only, okay, of 2017, what did we see? Now you can look down and say, one, two, three, four, five, drive failures column. You can see there's some things there that have nothing. My goodness, they didn't fail. That's great, right? Um, and then you can look at the Seagate one, uh, four terabyte Seagates, and say 267. Oh my gosh, that's horrible. Well, no, because when you do the annualized failure rate, they start to change, right? Um, start to change a little bit. Um, some people looked at the one for Seagate and said 3588. My goodness, that's a horrible drive. I never should buy that, right? No, um, it's just we had, a bad, we had a streak of bad luck with that particular drive in that particular quarter. This is only for the quarter. So when you look at the data, you have to look at it like that, right? Um, some of them didn't fail at all. Uh, nice uh, WDC, the Western Digital four terabyte ones, no failures at all, yay, all right? Um, but they only have 4,000 drive days on them. That's, a, that's too low a number to make an, any kind of decision with. We like to see you know, something that starts to look at 20,000 or so, 25,000 drive days before you really start to get to any conclusions. Um, we use this, the quarterly ones for trends. Is there anything funny going on? What happened since the last quarter and the last quarter before that? We actually track 
um, in, our, in our internal system, that moving three-month kind of window to see what's going on um, as a group. Uh, because one of the funny things is, um, is they seem to behave very, very similar. If you have a drive that seems to perform really well and then about three years out suddenly hits the wall, you'll see it in the numbers. Um, and, and, you know, and it's usually about 15 minutes after the warranty expires. But um. <laughs> This is the annualized numbers for all time. So for the lifetime period that we have the data for. Um, so this is starting to get to be serious, and that's why we put things like confidence intervals on it and stuff, because you have a really decent amount of data at this point. Um, and you can start to see, so that one Seagate drive that was at 3588, is it really that bad? 7.5% is not great. Um, that's probably not a good, a good drive for our environment. Um, but its companion right above it at 3% is cool, um, the 4 terabyte Seagate one. You can see some of the HGST ones slash HDS. Um, HDS is the old Hitachi data systems ones, and then they converted them over. Um, you can see those guys are just cranking along. They really, really like running in our data center. Right? Going to be a sad day when we finally get rid of those three terabytes. Um, just about as sad as it was getting rid of the twos. And just to put a plug in for Western Digital, we, we finally, when we took, they had one, um, one terabyte drives that we were using when we first started out, one terabyte Western Digital green drives. And those guys were running at around two, two and a half percent failure rate at six plus years. Okay, so <laughs> that's pretty darn good. They, and we were checking them out, and we still have them, by the way, and we actually abuse them by putting them into racks and when we, when we burn in the hardware. We put it in a bunch of drives and we burn in all of the other hardware. Um, so they get the tar beat out of them. Um, and they, they're still there hanging out, uh, really nice. So, we do this every quarter, okay? You can get a sense of what's going on um, and publish the kind of data that's out there. You can see in our environment, we're a little over 2% is the annualized failure rate. Now, the interesting thing about this is this is only the drives that are operational during the first quarter. So uh, at the end of December, so if you go back and look at the 2016 results, we actually published it for all of the drives that ever existed in our data center. Um, and that list was something like 50 some odd items long. Um, and the annualized percentage rate was actually a little higher because what would happen is, is we got a bad drive in there, all right, we would take it out. Um, we couldn't, couldn't live with a failure rate that was too high. Could, but it just made it life a little miserable, all right? Now, one of the questions that comes up with folks is, is, okay, I get it, I understand. Um, what about, what do you, what's a failure? What do you define as a failure, All right? So the first two are fairly obvious. Hey, I turned it on, it didn't work. Um, the second one, um, I turned it on, it spun, but it, won't, it just won't stay in my RAID array. Um, or it just won't stay working, it won't work well with friends, um, basically. The third one is the, the one that usually is kind of interesting. We use smart stats. We have a handful of smart stats, which I'll show you in a minute, which give us indicators that a drive is going south. Right? And it's, it's not an exact science. I wish I could tell you that it was, as soon as we saw this value here and this value here and this value here, that we could just pull the plug. It doesn't work that way. Um, but I'll show you a little study that the folks over at IBM did, which kind of give us some interesting ways that maybe it does work that way. Um, right now, that third one there is, is like I said, is, is experience and automation combined. Um, and we, we do a pretty good job. When we pull a drive out, by the way, we actually run it through a couple of batteries of tests, um, a, local, a local load test and then a, a secondary one, which it does the whole, um, basically like, a, like you would sync it into a RAID array. And if it holds up after that, we'll actually put it on the side and keep it as a spare. Um, but if it won't hold up, then it's failed and it's gone. So it's, it's not quite um, a human being there. There are some other steps that go beyond it, but that's what we use uh, for, your, for criteria. 
Now, what does that mean, okay? What have we seen? What kinds of interesting things have we seen for drive failures over time, right? So somebody produced this wonderful chart. Um, I'm going <laughs> to go this way. On the left-hand side, <laughs> all right, that's the bathtub curve, right? Oh, my goodness, it's going to be early infant mortality, and then the drives are going to settle in, and then as they wear out, you're going to get wear out failure, all right? Is that really true? And it kind of is. That, it's the same thing here, okay? There's an early infant mortality. There's a nice settling in of 1.4% failure rate. And then after about three years, um, it starts to increase. Now that actually, that number is actually pushed out. Um, what we're starting to see over the last couple of years, especially with the larger drives, is the infant mortality rate is still fairly high, uh, but that annual failure rate stretches a little bit longer. It stretches into like four years, three and a half, four years before you really start to see a, a fall off or an increase, if you want to say it that way, in survivability. Uh, of drives. So, so the curve seems to hold up, right? It may not be as pretty as all of that. It has a little bit different bend to it. But um, all of the things we kind of suspected, um, which is early infant mortality works really great, gets good, and then as it wears out, it starts failing, we see it. I like to put this one up because it's fun. Um, this is hard drive failure rates, right, cumulative by year. So each year, we looked at them, and they're cumulative. And you can see, uh, we had a little trouble with some three terabyte drives, right? The rest of them seemed to do OK. The one and a half, we never really had some, any success with. Um, just didn't fit right, right? Now, a lot of folks complain about and say, well, it's your environment, right? It's a data center. It's a fair thing. It's a data center. And so let me describe our environment, OK? We have those storage pods. And in those storage pods, the drives sit. And they sit vertically. They don't sit horizontally, which drives some people crazy. All right? Oh my goodness, they're not designed to sit like that. So they sit vertically. Um, they, we put them in a container. It's got a top. It's enclosed. It's fan. It has a fan. We'll see later we actually monitor the temperature of the drives, right? But it's in an air-conditioned data center. They don't move very often. Matter of fact, some of the storage pods haven't moved in years, right? So that's the environment that they're in. Well-maintained, they get filtered electricity, all right? They don't have to worry about brownouts or anything like that. Um, we don't have any cockroaches running around. There are no dust bunnies um, sitting around there. Uh, we don't drop them onto the floor uh, too often. Um, so it's actually a very interesting, it, the nice part about it is it's a nice environment, okay, and it's fairly stable, all right? Um, so when we compare drives, some fit really well. You can, those are those little guys, those are those two terabyte ones down at the bottom. I can, you can see that, right? Some of the fours do really well. Some don't fit. Um, it's as simple as that. Um, and one of the things that really fascinates folks is that we use consumer drives. Yeah, we do, right? We go, that's what allowed us to go down to Costco and buy drives when we couldn't get them through our channel when we were doing drive farming, right? We could just go down to the store and buy them because you could go down to the store and buy them. And they were consumer drives. Right? For the most part. I'll talk a little bit about that later. Right? And then some people say, well, have you ever compared them? I mean, gosh darn, those enterprise drives must be good. Right? They got to be better. So, oh, probably about two years, three years ago now, um, Brian did a little study. And we had a handful of enterprise drives that we used, not necessarily in the same way. We didn't use them as data storage. We used them as management drives and backup drives and so on. They were in the data center, but their, their use case was a little different. So it's not quite apples to apples, but he compared them, OK? And you can kind of see you don't really have a lot of years of service there. And, and he was soft on this. But when he, when he went down and looked at the annualized failure rate at the time, consumer drives 4.1. 
enterprise drives 4.6, we kind of said, well, even if we're off by a lot, okay, that's, that doesn't, is that really enough? Is it worth it to go spend money on an enterprise drive? Right? Interesting question. So we, we now have an experiment going on, okay, where we're, we're doing this again. So we have eight terabyte Seagates and the one, the, the M002 models are consumer drives. That's what they are. The M055, 0055s are enterprise drives by their classification, all right? And we put them in the service. Now, the enterprise drives have only been in service for about a month and a half, two months, really, all right? So don't draw any conclusions yet, but maybe next year I'll come back and we'll talk about that and see if there's a real difference. This is apples and apples. These are, these are in the same environment. They're sitting right, right next to each other in the data center. They're using for the same use case, right? Um, you're going to probably say infant mortality up front, 2.38%. Oh, okay. What is it going to come down to, All right? So we have an ability to compare these now. Now, why does that matter? Well, these come with, um, these come with two years of warranty. Those come with five years of warranty. If you were to buy them on the street, okay, we got a really good deal because that's, that model, by the way, is end of life and we were able to get our hands on them. That was the only reason we were able to do it, um, uh, because we wouldn't generally pay for an enterprise drive. Um, one exception, we did buy 45 HGST helium drives about two and a half years ago. It was the most expensive storage pod we ever built. Um, and it was like the price of three of them. Um, it was crazy, it was an experiment. We were giddy with money or something. Um, we did it once. Um, their failure rate, by the way, sits right in between those two numbers over time. So it's about 2% for the HGSTs. So we'll look at this. Um, we'll look and see. Um, because what's important, all right? What's important to us? This is us, not you, us, right? Cost per gigabyte, all right? We, the software we run in our data system doesn't care necessarily about drive failures. It's really not important. It's way down there. The failure rates are down there, all right? Yeah, you get 10 or 12%, you care a lot. The difference between 1% and 2% annualized failure rate is like three drives, all right? Um, it's nothing for us. So it's money. It's cost per gigabyte, which currently runs about two and a half to three cents uh, for the prices that we kind of get. All right, that's what matters, all right, to us. Um, what we see, by the way, now, there used to be this wonderful curve where the price came down, oh, you know, 17, 15, 12, 11, so on and so forth, and then we had the trial and drive crisis, and it went like this for a while, and then it started to settle out and continue down, and it got down to about four cents, and it, it started to flatten out. And then it got down to three and a half, and then two, two and a half, and now what happens is when a model gets down to about two and a half cents a gigabyte, the model goes away. They don't add the size. Sometimes they add the size. Sometimes they just change the model number and it goes back up to about four, four and a half cents. And then it comes back down again. And then maybe they'll, maybe they'll jump from six to eights. And then it jumps back up to six cents and then it drops back down. And then you get a couple of model reservations. So I don't know where the floor is, but right now it feels like two and a half cents, maybe two cents a gigabyte, okay? I'm sure, um, I'm sure some of the larger companies like Google and those guys can get that number lower, but, um, you know, we're buying them in chunks of five to 10,000 a piece, um, so that's the kind of numbers we can see. What's just as important as cost? Power. Ah, oh, man, there ain't nothing worse. We put those eight terabyte Seagate um, Enterprise drives in, right? And they lit up like a Christmas tree, the power they, they use, all right? We, we, have, we have a rack, and a rack uses, uh, I think it's 24, it's 30 amps, you, 30 amps of power each device in the rack, right? Um, and you, you, but your limit is 24 by spec. So when we put 60 of those in a pod and we stash it in, it literally blew the circuit. Okay, it's just too much power, too much power draw. 
Um, the eight terabyte consumer drives were right on the cusp. They were in like 23, eight or so when you put 60 of them in. Um, so we talked to Seagate, and Seagate actually gave us a setting. There's a power setting um, on an enterprise drive, which is really cool. We'd never seen one like that before. Uh, there's a little firmware setting you flip, and it actually reduces the power that you use. Uh, they didn't tell us exactly what it does to reduce the power, um, and, but um, when we did, it was actually able to bring the power down to be roughly equivalent to the power of a consumer drive, uh, which is really kind of cool. Um, and we still got performance out of it. So uh, we load these drives up. When we load these drives up, um, the way it is is a, a storage pod comes in, it becomes available on the internet, and people can load data on it, right? And we load it, um, that and all of its friends, till we get to about 80% full. And then after that, we just limit it, the amount of stuff that goes in. And those things typically run about 95% full, right? Um, that's the way they normally run. Um, so we measure that. We see how quickly those drives load and all of that because it's, it's all fair. And what we did, um, we compared the 8 terabyte Seagate consumer drives to the enterprise drives. The enterprise drives load about 40% faster, which makes sense. The, the spindle speed is a lot faster. Uh, the RPMs are a lot faster, right? Um, so it makes perfectly good sense. But that was even after we lowered the power. Um, so pretty cool. They loaded data faster. Now, in our environment, that's not interesting because all that means is, is they just get online more often for data, um, okay? Uh, in your environment, that may be something that's quite interesting for you um, to do that. Um, that's, the other thing is fitting our usage. Um, so they were talking a little bit earlier about SMR drives. Um, we tried SMR drives in our environment. Um, we tried it in uh, what we call a mini vault in our lab. And think about the model I just explained to you. We write a bunch of data out to something. That works really, really cool. But then what happens is, is over time, that data, some of that data needs to go get deleted, OK? A uh, customer goes away. A customer deletes their files. Um, certainly perfectly legitimate thing to do, right? And so with SMR files, that's a pain. Okay, and then add in, we want to recover the space and reuse it, which is a double, triple pane. Um, and so I think he was talking about kilobyte speeds, and yeah, kind of, uh, I don't, uh, well, that's exactly, we saw like a five, five times performance hit um, for SMR drives in our environment. So they just won't work for us. Not to, you know, they're perfect for great certain types of applications, but as soon as you have to lift up and erase or lift up and rewrite it, 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 in a particular zone, it just, everything comes to a, a, a complete halt for us. So it wasn't a good fit for our environment. Um, we tried them. People asked, hey, how would they work? The answer is they don't work for us. They may work for you. This is the type of place. And, and you know, to their credit, the drive manufacturers are not overselling them. They're saying, look, they're really good for this kind of thing, write once and store it away, because if you ever have to do anything else with it, it's going to hurt. Um, failure rates, right? That's where it starts to get important, and usually when you get to be, see big numbers. So a number, a 10% failure rate, 8% failure rate, yeah, okay, interesting. Um, uh, a 2% failure rate versus a 1% failure rate, not interesting at all. Um, warranty, we don't care. Right? We don't care. I, I, we do not have the time to go running around filling out stupid forms and tracking numbers and all of this kind of stuff for a drive failure. Sometimes, if you get in a bunch of them at the beginning and we put them in and four of them fail you know, on load testing or something like that, maybe we'll call up the, the place we bought them from, the reseller or whatever, and say, hey, five of these failed and he'll just swap them out or something like that. But when you try to replace something under warranty, what do you get back? You don't get a new drive back. You get a refurb back, right? And I'd rather not have them in my data center, thank you. Um, I, somebody else's problem. So don't really care. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's an interesting thing that some are two years, and some are five years. What was amazing was, for example, during the, um, the Thailand drive crisis is the warranty went from the same drive, where one week was three years, and then the next week was one year. Now, how did that happen? Um, 
right? Um, and then finally, speed. Um, I talked a little bit about that. Like I said, we put a, we put a box on the internet, actually we put a whole bunch of drives on the internet. Uh, it's, there's always ex, extra capacity uh, for people sending us data. Uh, that's not the issue, uh, ever the issue. So I don't care whether it spins at 5,400 RPMs or 72 or 1,500 or 15,000. They all, they all work for us. Um, so that's our environment. Um, a little bit, I've got a few more minutes here, um, talk about uh, smart stats and sick drives and can you figure all of that out? Can you use smart stats to do that? So we use these five right now, okay? Um, and you can see most of them apply, three of them um, apply to C, all of them apply to Seagate, and then a couple of them for other manufacturers, all right? Those are the five we kind of pay attention to. All right. Um, what have we found when you analyze our data? All right. If a drive is smart stat five, pick a number, right? Reallocated sectors, right? This is a value greater than zero um, with the raw value being greater than zero um, in there. So when you, you look at the smart stat and you say, hey, um, how many of the operational drives have that? 1.1% of them. How many of the failed drives had that attribute, right? And you can see 42.2% and so on. So no single attribute is particularly good at picking it out, right? There's, no, there's nothing there that jumps out and goes, wow, my goodness, 80% of the drives had SmartStat, the failed drives had SmartStat 188. Holy mackerel, that's a great indicator. Eh, it's not that simple. Um, it's not that simple, not that simple at all. all right? The other little trick <laughs> that thing you gotta know is that some of these, right, um, 180, uh, 197. Uh, what happens is, is you may have a, ca a current sector count. So it says, oh, I'm having trouble, I'm having trouble, and that number starts to bump up, one, two, three, seven, ten, blah, blah, blah. And then all of a sudden the drive says, ah, I figured it out, wait a minute, and it goes back down to zero. And so it depends on when you take your data uh, snap to. Other ones, by the way, never do that. They just continue to add. So it's one, it's two, it's three. Uh, we'll see in a second, high fly rights do that. Um, they just go and they go one, two, three, four, and so on, um, kind of a thing. But what we did is if you combine them all together, all right, and you say, look, if one or more of the attributes of those five attributes, right, triggers is greater than zero. Percentage of operational drives that happens in is 4.2%. Percentage of failed drives is 76, well, it's 0.7%, all right? Does it matter? Okay, what we're doing when we look and that human being jumps in a quick thing, starts to look at the data and say, hey, I see one of them triggered. Well, what, what, I see, an, eh, there's a second one. Usually there's something else going on at that point uh, with the drive too, right? And the drive gets pulled and checked, right? So can you decide, can you use those numbers? Hmm, I don't know if that feels good enough to do that with. So a couple of years ago, um, some folks over at IBM over in Switzerland apparently had nothing to do. Um, <laughs> um, and they did a nice study, and they took all of the data that we have uh, up to that point, and they analyzed it, and they, uh, they did a lot of math that I don't understand. Um, but you can look at the paper, there it is. If you look, predicting disk drive replacement, if you search for that, you'll probably see it. It's an IBM Switzerland paper, but there's the URL for it. Um, you may also be able to find it on Marella uh, Batatsu. Um, but this is what they found. They created a set of rules and a predictability based on all of the drive stats, not just our little five, right? Really cool, right? So we had 197 was one of ours, and they said, look, if that raw value is greater than or equal to two, just throw the drive out, it's gonna fail. That's really, that's pretty powerful. 
right? And you can see the other combinations. How about, but look, if it's less than two, and some of the other values are certain ranges and so on and so forth, it's a healthy drive. Don't replace it. All right? Now, that's starting to get to be pretty interesting. And we've seen a couple of other folks who have sent us data as well and said, hey, we have looked at it. And the, que the only question they ever come up with is, is that, remember I said smart stats number earlier on? So these guys have decided that they went and said, could we use smart stats to predict failure? Now, one of the things that we're going to do over the next three to six months, depending on how much time I have, is, is their data stopped at the end of 2015. So let's see if they're right for 2016. Let's see if, if I have a drive with a smart a raw value of greater than two, did it fail? Right? I mean, that, they said 100% confidence in them. That's, that's, that's easy. That's a one or a zero, right? So it'll be kind of fun to see. They also did um, the same thing for HGST and Hitachi drives. The previous one was for Seagate drives, by the way. Uh, and they did the same thing for them. Uh, and the other vendors we just don't have enough drives for that they could do the analysis on. Um, but these two here, right? And as you notice, slightly different, uh, different numbers. Uh, if the smart value 197 is greater than one, and SMART3 raw is greater than 626, and I don't know what that one is off the top of my head. I don't have it memorized all 254 of them. Um, you know, replace the drive. 100% confidence interval. So what we'll do is we'll test this, okay, against our data for 2016 and potentially up as much of it as we have in 2017 and see how well it was at good at predicting. Yes? Yeah, yeah, they do. I, th that's a really good question because one of, um, somebody else did an analysis of this from what, I, what they called a, um, a, what's the survivability rate? This is a failure rate. They looked at it from the other side, which is what's the survivability of trimes, and so when does it go to zero? Um, and from the data, they were out at 12 or 14 years, but of course they didn't have the data, so you're just drawing a fake line at that point. Um, uh, but I think they had the data, they, their forecast was like someplace in the 12 to 14 year range, every drive should fail. Now, in this room, there's going to be somebody who says, well, I've had a drive for 17 years and it still works. So, um, you know, so it's still, it's a possibility. But the, um, where, the real issue is, is what's your confidence? Of, you know, what's a good number for you? If it's 95%, if you had 100 drives and 95 uh, failure rate, you're going to start, you know, and you want to be at 95, man, they may only be three or four years, um, you know, as to what you want to do. Uh, there have been implementations, uh, the folks at Netflix, for example, did this um, a long time ago where they took, uh, they took our pod design and they did a lot of fun stuff with it. Um, but what they did is that they stored data, their movies on these storage pods, their own design, again, um, but and on the drives. And they would store them all out there and close it up and send it out uh, to various places around the country so it was closer to where people were downloading from. And the reason that, um, and then what would happen is, of course, is over time, the drives would fail. But they needed about three to four years uh, worth of that. What they figured if, if every drive in there could fail after four years and they didn't care, because most of the time people weren't going to watch those movies anymore. Um, and so, <laughs> right? And if they were, they would, be, they would only be the only person watching that movie, and so streaming it from a central data center was not a problem. Um, so it was a pretty good model. Um, and I've seen that model taken care of. So I don't know the, if there's a real hard number that says after 12 years everything ends uh, or something like that, but we have seen that model before. In, uh, shucks, uh, I don't remember which one. One of the quarterly, a couple of the different quarterly uh, reports that I've done, I've called out that model. There's a guy over in, um, in Australia, no, New Zealand who did it, did the analysis. Um, 
uh, catch me. If you want to know about that analysis, I, I, catch me and I'll, I'll find it for you. I don't have the reference right off the top of my head. All right. And just for fun, uh, what other things that we look at um, uh, is, uh, I mentioned earlier, high fly rights. Um, right? That's when the head flies out um, is of its parameters. Let's just go with that. Or it's normal range of operation, right? You'd think that would be a pretty good one. Right? If your drive heads are starting to wander a little bit on you, maybe you got some problems coming up. Well, the trouble we had with that one was it did a good job of predicting failure, but it also did a good job of, you, it happened a lot in operational drives. Right? Um, so it wasn't particularly useful. But one of the things we observed was there's a clustering that goes on. So if you get high fly rights that occur in a short period of time, you have a problem. Right? Getting 52 high fly rights one, one a week is not an interesting thing. Getting 52 of them in an hour is a very interesting thing. And our system isn't particularly good, quite honestly, at monitoring at that level. That's not something that was built into our system. So it's a really interesting stat if, you're, if you want to go chase it down. Um, but you have to have that time component in there because generally that, you know, that's what's going on. Um, Another one was spin retries. So, hey, I just turned on the system. How many times does it take to, spin, to try to spin this thing up? Right? Um, we don't turn off our systems very much. Hence, that's the problem with this one. So we couldn't get any data out of it. Right? But it, you would think it makes perfectly good sense if you just apply a little logic and say, well, if I turn on the system and it doesn't spin up right away, it takes a couple of times, maybe something's going on with that drive. Maybe the lube is starting to go a little dry, or whatever the case may be, right? The spindle's not working. Whatever, the servos, it's not, the motor's not kicking in right away. Any number of different things, but maybe that's a problem, but we couldn't find it in ours just because we couldn't, we don't spin them up very often. We don't turn them off and turn them on. Um, but in your environment, that may be a very interesting thing. If you're turning off your drive every day and turning it back on, that may be something to pay attention to. Um, the other one that's always um, everyone's favorite is, is power cycling, right? You know, do I turn my computer off at the end of the day or do I just leave the drive running? And I know there's things that take the drives down and shut them off and all of those kinds of pieces of software, especially in consumer drives, right? Um, but we turn all of that off. Um, so this is all I can tell you. Okay, one, we don't turn our drives off very often. I just said that. Okay, but for the drives that failed, right, they had um, a lot more power cycling going on. Right, we were turning them off and on for whatever reason, the pods that they were in. All right, and this is uh, lifetime. So we may turn off a, a storage pod once a year, right? Maybe twice a year, something like that. So drives that we were turning off a little more often failed a little more often. Eh. Okay. Does that mean you should just leave everything running? I didn't say that because we really don't have enough cycles in there. I mean, you know, you know, to do it. But that's where the data kind of goes. Last little bit, uh, temperature. Just for fun, I know Google did this a couple of a few years ago, um, and we uh, we just we got carried away with it. Um, again, one of the funny things we found is is that failed drives are a little colder than than drives that are operational, right? Which was really kind of weird because we didn't expect that. Um, this is what happens. Uh, this is what it looks like in our data center, right? For all of the drives we have, the average temperatures roughly 78 degrees, 79 degrees Fahrenheit, um, right, 26 degrees Celsius. That's where most of the drives are, um, right? And uh, with a th what I call a 30-day look back. So this isn't just at a given day. This is the average temperature over the previous 30 days. And that's important uh, when you look at the next one, which is failures, right? This is failures by manufacturer, right? And so it's got that 30-day back. So one of the reasons why you need the 30-day backs is because if a drive fails, it probably doesn't produce much heat. <laughs> okay, <laughs> it's just kind of sitting there. Um, so you want to go look back and make sure you're seeing that. So the funny thing about it is, is that there's no. Um, sometimes way down here, 
they'll heat up a little bit. That's probably some type of heat problem. But generally, drives don't seem to throw off a lot of heat. And this is, by the way, we're measuring the internal temperature of the drive with uh, SmartStat 194. So that's inside the drive. That's not like the flow through or anything like that or the room temperature or anything like that. That's the temperature the drive's reporting. Uh, one of the coolest things is that the orange one, the Western Digital one, kind of looks like Batman's helmet. Um, <laughs> I can't, I, I just look at that and I go, that's what it is. It's either that or the guy from SpongeBob. I, one of the, anyway. Um, uh, so, interesting, uh, our friends at HGST, right? Uh, heat doesn't seem to be a particularly interesting, it can fail anywhere along the lines, right? Uh, Seagate seems to have a little point uh, where they fail in the Western Digital ones. Um, that could be an anomaly based on the fact that we don't have a, a lot of Western Digital drives, hence we don't have a lot of Western Digital failures. So maybe that Batman cows kind of evens out a little bit. Um, but it does look like it heats up a little bit before it fails. Uh, the Western Digital drives may give you a little bit of indication if you start to see the temperature climb internally, um, they may be starting to go towards failure. Uh, if you remember, most of them were at 77, 78 degrees Fahrenheit, um, kind of a thing. All right, so, so that's what we do for a living, right? We, uh, we, we actually do backup and cloud storage and all kinds of fun stuff like that uh, for a living. And then uh, my, my night job is playing around with this kind of data. Um, we do record it. Uh, if you want it, let's see, uh, I'll put it up there. Um, that's the URL. You can go there, you can download it, you can play with it. Uh, it we also listed all of, the, um, all of the different reports we've done, so you can go look at all of the different reports there. It's all on that page, all right, uh, and go play with it. I encourage you to do it. it. Now, the files are getting big, really, really big, um, uh, so uh, bring, bring a good network connection, um, and you'll have to download them in pieces. Um, but go play with them, have some fun. If you have some fun data uh, that you'd like us to take a look at at some point, let me know. Okay, very good. Thanks, Andy. I'm sure there's questions, so, um, yeah. Uh, Is your uh, pattern of use mostly write once, and how often do you maybe write uh, multiple times to disk, and how often do you read, roughly? So, so this, the, model, the model is is that predominantly mostly writes initially, and then once a drive settles into that about 95% full range, it's going to be read, write, um, mostly reads uh, at that point, um, deletes at some point. We run what's called cleanup jobs every so often. Um, it's, it's one of those things we kind of batch up and run through. Um, and then, um, and then we del delete files, and that makes the space available. And we write back to it until we get about 95, 98 percent again, and then it goes into that read cycle. So, um, is the read cycle much less frequent than writing? Like no, no. People want their data back, um, and so we give it to them, um, which is a good thing. Um, <laughs> so, but yeah, it's. Um, it's not as intense, um, and you know, so we'll fill up, for example, a, a hard drive, an eight terabyte hard drive will take, in, in a whole setup, uh, will take something in the order of 45 to 60 days, just depends. Um, and then it'll go into service for, you know, as long just doing what I described, so. Yeah. Yes, Tom. So Andy, you've got mostly um, consumer hard disk drives. Yeah. And there's different ratings for these drives, and, but you do seem to observe what might be wear out. Do you see that correlating at all with, like, the warranty terms they typically have for those drives, like how many how many terabytes you can write on them, that sort of thing? I, so, I'm just wondering, if you are seeing any real correlations? Um, it's a good question. So the the correlation that we saw and is. When we had the drive crisis and warranties went from three years down to one year on consumer drives in particular, um, the drive failure rates went up substantially uh, on those drives. Um, you can relate that to the fact that it was difficult to get parts, hard to manufacture drives, all of those interesting things related to the Thailand drive crisis. Um, but uh, that was the only correlation uh, you know, that we ever really saw specifically to warranty and so on and so forth. And, to be honest, it's, it's, 
it, it's, it, it's a fun thing to go and look at, but it has no effect on our business, so we don't spend a lot of time with it. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, so are these all 54 and 7200 SATAs? 54s, there's some 59s in there, and they're all SATAs, yeah. They're and all they're, SATAs. Yeah. Have you guys looked at any, uh, do, you, do you do drive firmware updates? Have you looked at uh, firmware revs of drives and whether that correlates to failures? Have you looked at SATA control, you know, specifics of SATA controllers and SATA controller firmware? Because it seems like a lot of that stuff might actually be a fairly significant secondary effect. It, it, it is. Um, it, so the, the answer to the first qu the question as we go, the, the other components certainly can contribute to failure as well, although certainly they contribute, let's just say, equally. Um, do we update firmware? Uh, when we get update, uh, firmware updates from, our, uh, from the suppliers, the manufacturers, we usually talk to them about what the nature of that is um, and see if it's something that's going to affect us or not. And then we can update the farm if we need to. So, for example, the Seagate drives were an excellent example of that. We had um, 1,200 of them installed. We brought them up. We said, oh, my goodness, look how much power they're using. Uh, Seagate said, well, why don't, here's a nice setting you can go to. It took a few minutes to go through and update the firmware setting on all of those things and, and go from there. Um, not normal behavior for us. Uh, we don't spend all day doing those kinds of things, but we do it. Um, as it relates to other components, we're relatively consistent with the manufacturers we've bought from. We don't, um, we buy generally from uh, all of our backplanes and all of our SATA cars and cables and so on come from the same manufacturer. Um, I suppose we could map them to lot numbers and all kinds of things like that. We've never done something they like that. Too, right? they, they might have different firmware as well. Um, and the thing about it is, is We'll bring up uh, a farm of drives, let's say, you know, uh, a 1,200 drives in LBC gate. Then the next 1,200 drives in a vault will be a different manufacturer, HGST or whatever the case may be. Um, so we've never done that breakdown. That's an interesting breakdown uh, to do that. Your, your, your outlier on the Seagate, yeah. Could be, could be, I, and I don't know the answer, uh, if that's truly the case or not. Yes. Uh, two questions for you. Uh, first, with the number of spinning drives you guys have in the environment, have you witnessed any gyroscopic effect, macro or micro? And second, um, performance-wise, are you seeing it mainly in terms of faster RPM speed, or is it also a function of cache on the drives as well that drives that? So, um, so the first question, the first answer, I believe, is no, okay. okay. Um, the second one, the, the speed, uh, speed thing, again, it's, that's not an important factor for us um, because we're just going to fill them up. Um, they're gonna, whether they fill in 45 days or 51 days, not an interesting thing because there's always another farm right behind it ready to take their place. Uh, we, ha we, we count something called, um, uh, the, it's basically a, a, day, a, a time in the future where we'll run out of space. Um, if we, if, we have no, if we deploy no more environment, when are we going to run out of space? And so we try to keep that number at at least 90 days and preferably, preferably something over in the order of 180 days. So if we never have deployed another drive, okay, we'd have 180 days worth of space. So we always back that up with another vault in this case. We don't do pods anymore. We group the pods into a vault and that's 1,200 drives going into play. So uh, that's, we, don't, we just don't care um, uh, as to how quickly or how slowly they fill, other than if it was something ridiculous, like it took 180 days to fill. Yeah, okay, we'll probably never buy them again. Um, but every drive we put in their environment goes through the mini lab first. Um, and so we test them all, make sure they're right. We go through, we, we do uh, load testing and everything like that. because. If they're going to fall apart, I don't want them. The SMR drives are a great example, okay? They, they might have performed really well, although we kind of figured they wouldn't, but let's give them a chance. And when they didn't, I, I don't need to put them in my stats and yell at them at that point. Um, I just need to say, we tried them, they didn't work our environment, good luck. You know, if you, but they may work in yours, so, yeah. 
Great, I also have uh, two questions. Yeah. One, if you could please classify uh, or, or describe how you classify an operational drive in your data set. Uh, like, do you filter out all possible drives that have never failed? Uh, or do you group them by like a, a large number of device days that they've been online? Uh, and second, uh, do you currently remove drives uh, from your data centers that uh, have these abnormal smart values? Or do you actually wait for them to actually fail? So we do, I'll, I'll get to the second one first. We do actually, we have been known to remove them when they have the abnormal smart values. It usually is in combination with, like I said, the, the human being, you just get a feel for it. My goodness, that had zero yesterday, it now is six. Okay, that's weird, what else is going on? Oh, look, I'm getting errors across the bus on it. You know, and, and so you take that drive out at that point. It actually doesn't get marked as a failure until it goes through the other tests and fails out. Um, um, but that's the way we do it. And the first question was, now I forgot. Um, operational drive. Okay. So an, a drive is either failed or operational or in that quasi state of trying to decide if it is. But you won't, in, in our records, it'll look legitimate. It'll look like it stopped, but it won't have a one. Okay, it'll just be a zero, and it'll stop recording drive days because we took it out of the environment. We test it out, it fails. Oh, my goodness, it failed, we give it a one. Um, oh, it's still good. Okay, we'll put that out as we'll hold it for a spare. The reason we hold it for a spare is quite honestly, um, we like to have all of the drives in a pod, storage pod to be the same model. Just makes kind of sense. So if I have 45 or 60 drives of the same model, um, and I can't get that model anymore. Um, I'd like to have a few spares in case something goes out and I substitute out and that's, we hold it. And if it comes back in, and you'll see that in the data sometimes where something will be there, it'll be running, 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 all of a sudden it'll just disappear. It'll be gone for six months and then it'll show back up. Okay, and that's why we count drive days. So those six months don't count. Okay, and then it goes and it runs, and let's say it fails three months later, then it has a failure, and all of those things become part of the, the record. So. So, the, so the drives that you have failed every day previous to that is considered an operational stack. That's correct, yes. Do you consider those in your operational stack? Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah that, that, that makes, up the pers and it makes up the data of all of the drive days that that drive model, in that case, uh, was operational. Hopefully this is an easy one. Um, so as your drives are running, do you adjust the power parameters for them at all? Do you prevent them from spinning down, or is just out of the box running? So a lot, it all depends. We talk to the drive manufacturer to see what they do when they shut the drives down. So for example, um, green drives, um, the newer green drives, were really a pain because they like to shut down. And our environment is, is a fairly active environment, even, you know, even if it's just a read or something like that. Um, so we generally don't like to spin the drives down, um, especially completely. Now, some of them have a mode where they'll kind of go a little bit of sleep, but not really. And um, uh, so we talk to the drive manufacturers about what they think the best way to do it is and change the firmware appropriately, if it's appropriate. We generally don't have to, but sometimes we found that if we do, if we shut off that mode entirely, um, so it just stays spinning, it's just better for the drive and its performance all the way around. Okay. And so they may not last five years, they may only last four years, but they're not gonna be doing this kind of a thing and having trouble because they were failed and jerked it back up and failed. You know, they, they, they're not failed. They slow down, they come back up, slow down. There's nothing worse than doing that to a drive and just keep, you know, up and down and up and down, so. Okay, and then uh, slightly related to that, um, you ever had a power outage at your data centers? And did you have any- So we had one um, back when we, we had original, one of our earlier data centers was in Oakland. Um, and the, uh, the, the janitorial crew hit the big red button. Uh, can't tell you why, it wasn't just us, it was everybody in the data center. Um, and yes, we, we had a pay data center and um, everybody in the company at that time went, literally got up and went to work at two o'clock in the morning down at the data center um, so we could bring up the, the pods individually um, and bring them online. And it took us about four or five hours to get all of that done. Um, there's even a blog post about it with our CEO, Gleb, standing there, looking very tired, standing next to one of the little uh, machines there. Um, the, uh, but yes, it, it has happened. 
Um, the, new, the new place that we're in, the new places that we're in are uh, multi-power. Um, so the one that we were in initially wasn't. Um, so it only has a single source of power. Um, so, uh, so not that we observed. Um, the things just kind of, you know, they just shut down. They're, it's losing power. I mean, it's just like pulling a plug on a darn thing. It's not particularly elegant. It's a little problematic with uh, the data. Um, and so that was the hardest part of getting the things to FS, getting the drives to FS check and make sure you knew where they were, and then reporting back. In that particular case, they were reporting back to an application on a Mac or a PC and figure, comparing notes about where they left off. And so everything was fine. It just took a little while to catch up. You, you brought up that uh, SMR drives don't work in your environment. Uh, possibly due to the shingling, but it seems that the disk drive guys are starting to stretch their technology now trying to get to hammer bit pattern media and things like that. As those new technologies come out, do you foresee error rates going up? Do you foresee, I mean, that's one of the things you have to forward predict your costs. So I, as they stretch that technology, what are you seeing? So the good part about, um, about where we are right now is, is that at least we get talked to by the manufacturers. <laughs> we, we buy enough drives now so that they, they, we have a good relationship with most of the different manufacturers, and they, they'll clue us in as to what they're thinking about planning. The hammer drives is a good example. Um, we'll get an early sample of some of them. We'll try them out. We'll see what's going on. Um, and again, it is, it, for us, it's just about failure rates because the software just covers all of that. I mean, it's not failure rates. It's, the software covers the failure rates. And as long as the drives stay within a reasonable set of parameters of, you know, two, three, four, five percent or something like that, we're fine. Um, the SMR drives just didn't work because of the speed. Um, if the hammer drives don't work for some other attribute, um, the thing we worry about the most is, is um, you know, we do use consumer drives. We pay a consumer drive price for those. How large are those going to get? Um, you know, is, are they really going to make 16 terabyte consumer drives, for example? Um, you know, it's a good question. Um, uh, so uh, that's more of a worry than a particular technology because we have some visibility into that. So, all right. Any other questions? Thank, thank you.